Now playing California Triathlon Soup. Welcome to another episode of California Triathlon Soup, two parts triathlon, one part cultural relevance, and one part, a little part of fun. Today we have special guest, uh, John Cobb, who is um, J. Cobb's CTO, chief designer. He's been in this industry for five decades, and we're going to learn a lot more about uh, about what, what, what John does and what makes him passionate. John, welcome. Well, I'm glad to be here. So your um, your your company's based in Tyler, Texas, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> I've been in Tyler for about 20 years. I was originally in Shreveport, Louisiana, and moved over here uh, several years ago. And um, you know, really like it here in East Texas. And you've been um, originally, and we're going to get into great detail about the product lines um, and and those product lines, um, and and learn about a little bit more about the both the retail business and the online business um but this thing started your your business tell us a little bit about how the business started and where you're where you're at now um uh, well my original business i started in shreveport back in uh 1980 and i was uh, just a bike rider and and people were having trouble being comfortable so i started adjusting them on local bike rides and then all of a sudden i started selling bike parts and it kind of grew. And then I, a few years ago, I kind of was sort of tired of retail and all that. So I sold the business and uh, fell about it. And, and uh, then just lately, we've decided to change the name to this J. Cobb because uh, Cobb Cycling just didn't really, it had been around a long time. We needed, you know, kind of a new start. Uh, so, and there's also a, a Cobb car parts thing that's pretty big. And we kept getting stepping on each other with that. So it was a good time to change. And so uh, we're doing this J Cobb and uh, it lets me continue uh, developing these seats and running shorts and, um, you know, crank sets and all the little different products that we do. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. We've known your products, at least initially, you have a, some, some new product lines, which I'm not sure everybody knows about, but saddles and I've always said when folks buy a bike, the saddle isn't typically the first thought. So potentially the manufacturer put on something that works, but maybe isn't perfect. Um, it's similar to sometimes when they put uh, tires on and they're not putting Continental 4000 S's or something really nice. And that's one of the first things I trade out is I just trade out the tires because, you know, typically they're they're just not that good. You have a product that's an aftermarket product. How do people come to find your product and use your product? Well, the um, biggest problem or kind of a strange thing about cycling is that I'll, I'll say a, not 100%, but I'll say about 90% of the people will buy a new bike. And it doesn't matter if it's a $400 bike or a $4,000 bike. They buy, they go bike riding on it and they come back and go, man my butt is killing me but they keep riding it and it, you know everybody says yeah it's gonna hurt but it'll get better and sometimes it doesn't get better it just keeps hurting but people still go ride their bikes and so there's something pretty valuable about bike riding that people seem to enjoy so you you know i tell people all the time you can take most any bike seat and if you have it on my fit stand here and I adjust you, I can probably get you pretty comfortable. But after a while, you're still going to either have saddle sores or, or numbness problems or something. And uh, that's when you have to start changing seat shapes because the humans aren't like cars. I mean, we, we're not mechanical. So we all have leg length differences or foot size difference or hip offset or stiff back or scoliosis or something. And so you have to account for all that. And that's why like I ended up making nine different models of seats. Well, that's that's a uh, and they're not different just in color. They are completely different, and it's because I would 
be working with a group and they'd consistently have a problem. I said, well, okay, I'm going to make a new seat for them. And, uh, and so that's the whole thing about the long answer to your question is that uh, you don't have to get a different seat. You can ride on anything. It's just what's your tolerance level. And as you get more involved in particularly a sport of triathlon where you're running and, and, you know, cycling a lot, then the saddle comfort becomes a big limiting factor to your speed. Yeah. You know, I started with uh, the standard bike saddle and, you know, who knew that you, there were other options available. And when I would see uh, like a, a split nose um, saddle, I would sort of wonder if that's like, wow, do you have some sort of medical problem or why did you have to get that uh, until you use one? And then you're like, okay, uh, speed and comfort is, um, it's a, it's, a, it's just different. And when you, when you get a saddle, which I have one on, on my road bike, it's, it's just a much nicer experience. And if you're going to spend hundreds of hours a year on your bike, then maybe it's worth that investment. That's exactly right. Um, it's it's sort of like running shoes. You know, people understand that running shoes kind of have a given life. It can only go so far, <clears throat> and then you need more of them. Well, <clears throat> I guess they expect bike seats to last forever, and whatever's on your bike should work, but it doesn't work out like that. And so think how many pairs of different brands of running shoes you go through till you find one where the last is curved right for you or the support's right. And I mean, that's $150 a shot on that, but people go buy all kinds of shoes and they'll listen to someone say, oh, I've got to have a, a Brooks or a Saucony or, you know, whatever. And, and they go buy them and then they run them a little bit and then their joints start hurting. They go, wow, this, this isn't very good. And so they'll try something else. So, I mean, bike seats are a little bit like that, but now there's enough uh, <clears throat> shops and bike fitters that'll let you test them a good bit uh, before you start spending that money. So it's helped that part of the program a lot. And and Cobb's, uh, uh, Jacob has a program where you can try a seat and you have a certain amount of time and you, you can return it. You're not, you're not married to that seat forever, correct? That's right. It's got a 30 day program where you can try it and, and return it for 100% of your money back. No real questions. Uh, we have a thing that we're doing now to where we're going to do these Zoom broadcasts. So, so when you buy a seat, you can get your bike on a trainer and have your tool set there and I'll help you set it up. And I mean, it's free. And so it's part of our service. And so I think that's going to be a real good thing. And a lot of times, you know, the bike fit uh, is just so important to saddle comfort and you can buy a new seat and put it on and not be any better off because your stem is too long or your seat height's too high or whatever. And, and uh, you know, I, I've only fit, you know, several thousand people. And so I've got a pretty good eyeball for knowing if you're basically on the bike, correct. Uh, and so there's things about hand weight and shoulder weight and all that you got to, that the seat helps fix. And so you've got to address all that and how you set your bike up. And you, um, you know, you have a, a large retail channel, but a lot of the business, a lot of business is moving online. So this is looked at as an assisted sale. And I'm looking at the, um, you know, the plethora of items for those who are uh, uh, looking at us not, uh, you know, just on video and audio. There's a plethora of items in the background and there's nine choices. And I'm trying to figure out which one for me. Um, how do you how do you do that? How do you uh, how would I go online and know which was the right choice for me? Is there just a, a series of trial and error? Well, um, a little bit trial and error, unfortunately, um, but it, it's kind of interesting. The uh, trends for a little while were um, everybody started going back, wanted to use some kind of split nose seat. And um, I'm a, certainly a big proponent of pressure relief channels down the middle of the seat. But um, split nose seats, when you go to a race and you start walking around and, and looking at the bike racks and what's out there, well, you've got um, two kind of two things. You've got OEM seats that are just put on the bike and people just ride them because, you know, I just spent eight grand on my bike and, and the seat ought to be pretty good for that much money, even though it isn't necessarily the case. It might not be the right seat for you. 
Doesn't mean the seat's bad, it's just not for you. But uh, <clears throat> you look around and, and just traditional shaped bike seats are still 70 or 75% of the field. So I'm sitting there as a designer and manufacturer going, well, why am I spending $30,000 for moles per seat shape when I could just put a standard looking seat on there? But uh, as you get more involved in the sport uh, and you have specific problems, saddles can do a lot to really affect your performance. And uh, it's like this, I have to apologize. I'll end up wandering off in my conversation. So bring me back if I get too far. No, it's fantastic, John. But, uh, this is Zwift and, you know, online racing has really brought out a whole new situation in uh, bike fitting and bike performance because now uh, perceived effort has become a real thing that you can depend on in your uh, fitting and changes in an athlete. Uh, that's where our, our short cranks are starting to really show up because when you're doing a, let's just say a Zwift race or a roadie race, your heart rate and your power and, you know, your calorie burn, all that's projected on the screen right there in front of you. Well, you don't have dogs and you don't have cars, you don't have people bothering you. So you're, you're really focused on your performance. Well, if you make a, a seat change and all of a sudden you're up an average of five watts, versus your heart rate, well, that's a real gain. Uh, if you make a crank change and all of a sudden your heart rate drops five or seven beats average for a you know 45 minute workout, well, that's a, a real change. Whereas on the road, when a person says, well, I feel better, well, that's, that's kind of a guesstimate in perceived effort. But with the uh, advent of the uh, online racing, the perceived effort is a real tuning tool. And uh, so I've gotten to where I really, I go to some different racers' houses and take stuff there. And, and you know, these are hardcore Zwift racers. And, and you know, they, they know their watts and their heart rate. And they know all that stuff down to the watt. And uh, we'll go in and make changes on their position. And, and it just shows up. And then they'll race all week and map that out. And it, it's a big deal. It's really helped me as a fitter pay more attention to, to a bunch of things. And, and uh, you know, to get comfortable on a stationary bike is pretty tough. Uh, really, if, if you're doing a long workout, we've got, as you know, uh, you've got so many customers that, that do four, five, and six-hour bike trainer rides in their basement. That would shoot me now if I had to do that. But that's, you know, they live in Canada or wherever. That's what they do. So comfort's a, a big deal. Well, so so that goes on to so one of the areas that until recently I didn't know that um, that Jacob did, and that was uh, crank arms. Mm -hmm. And and one of the questions that that I get um, is, you know, I, I noticed that there are you know four choices and they're X number of millimeters different, and you know, it can't be. It can't be that much of a difference, one one crank arm to the, to the next. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer, and uh, so I, I, I do understand a bit about that science. Um, but I would love to hear your your point of view on why is there four distances, four lengths? Why are they that far apart? If they're, do they need to, you know, explain the, the variation. Well, <clears throat> I did a talk a couple of years ago at this thing in Colorado called Cycling of Science, or Science of Cycling, and big deal. Um, and they were all asking me kind of the same question. And so my first slide that comes up is a picture of Moses coming down the mountain with his tablet. And on there I put, thou shalt not ride 172.5 cranks. And uh, they all kind of laughed. And I said, well, where did the length 170 millimeters come from? Where did 175 millimeters come from? It, you know, I've been bike riding since 1972, and my my old Raleigh that I first got had, you know, 170 cranks on it. But what did that really mean? And um, and I have no idea. I think that's just some number that the Italian guys liked and they started using back a long time ago. But um, but product 
product managers are who choose crank lengths for their production bikes. And so if they're old school bike riders and they've been riding 170s or, you know, or if they're six feet, 10 tall, you know, they're going to go to 175 or 180s. So that's what trickles down to the consumer. That doesn't mean it's right. But to mess with that, to change your cranks and all is kind of open heart surgery to a lot of people. They go, this is pretty scary. This isn't like changing my handlebar tape. This is changing my cranks. You know, I said, well, it's going to shift the same. It's going to do everything. And I got I got to doing uh, a lot of work on this a bunch of years ago because I was overweight. And so my legs were hitting my stomach. And I said, well, I'm just going to shorten my cranks and fix that problem. <laughs> That's great. Work, work perfect, yeah. That's great. <laughs> Want to diet or anything? So uh, I did that, and then it turned out that I had a lot of customers that were starting to have hip replacements and things like that. Or as you just get older, uh, you just don't have the flexibility. Uh, so we were doing these shorter cranks. Well, the need got to be enough that I was initially using these little square taper BMX cranks. And it was a, having to rig up all this stuff is a nightmare and they wouldn't shift. They didn't do anything. So I made the investment and really started, you know, doing cranks. Uh, and, you know, one of the biggest things advantages is that for women or shorter riders, uh, it, it fixes their toe overlap problems because so many people, you turn your handlebars and your wheel hits your bike shoes and you crash. And uh, it really helps with all that. And so um, there, there's just a, a bunch of things that start showing up. But then, you know, I did a good bit of, uh, you know, lab testing on it. And, uh, you know, your oxygen uptake and all can be a lot better because your muscles aren't having to contract as long per stroke. That ends up being the science. Um the leverage point, everybody says, well, if you shorten your crank, you lose your leverage. Well, that isn't how that really works. Your leverage is figured from the center of the axle to the edge to where your chain intersects the chain ring. So if you really want to affect your leverage, you you would have to change your chain ring size to do that. And that's why when you go from a 53 tooth to a 39 tooth, you can go up the hills easy. It's the leverage point changes. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, mechanically, you can do some big math and find that there's a, you know, a 0.8% difference in torque, but that won't show up. Even on a Zwift race, it won't show up because your, your um, oxygen levels are so much better because your muscle contraction time is so much shorter. Are you a fan of uh, 1X? One and by um, I kind of am in that. Back in, um, I always hate to say that back in thing, but back in uh, about 87, I built a similar thing for my wife on her bike because she just couldn't figure out that shifting. So I made it a single chain ring front and it built a nine speed free hub thing for this thing. So she'd go down the road and, and it, she liked it because she just had to move that lever and everything worked great. Uh, but now that we've got, you know, 12 tooth cog sets and all of it. I mean, you know, 12 speed cog sets available. But one by is the slick system. I mean, you're still going to give up a little something, but not, not a lot. And uh, it's just better. And it's just a simpler thing. Cause a lot of people, I, I have people who literally can't figure out right and left. And so then the concept of moving all those levers is, is crazy. You know, so. So in terms of um, you have recently, um, you've recently gotten back in the tri game. You've recently uh, focused on your own fitness. Um, you want to give us a little update on that? And then I would love to hear your thoughts about the difference between when you started your first you know, race back in the 70s and uh, the last race that you've done here in 2000, say, 20. Well, <clears throat> um Triathlon sport was pretty new and we had heard about it and I had my retail shop and everybody says, we need a triathlon. So for the first race I ever went to, we literally hung the stopwatch on a tree. And the first guy that finished started recording the times as you came in. We only had about 25 people. So it was nice. And I took my cousin, we go to the local bio and go swimming. And I had my wife up there. I said, you honk the horn after 20 minutes and we'll get out of the water. Well, we've been swimming out there. It's for like two hours and we let's go to the shore. She's gone to sleep or something. Well, we get out and it'd been like five minutes, you know, 
So it was kind of, that's the fun stuff. And uh, so we started doing triathlons and, and uh, you know, it was all sprint races or a big deal to do an Olympic race back then. And I'd started hearing about this Kona Ironman thing, but that was in the way, you know, in the mid eighties, just barely any traction on that at all. And uh, so, but it was fun. It was, you know, you'd, you'd go to a race to hear about where the next race was because they're, you know, sort of on the internet. And you'd start building kind of a traveling circus for a family. And it was just a lot of fun. Uh, so uh, bikes, you know, no aero bars, none of that. And, and then in the uh, uh, early 90s and all through the 90s and 2000s, uh, Steve Head and I were going to Kona. We started going over there to the Ironman and, uh, that was like going to Disneyland because you get all these guys from Europe and all these people from all over the world. The Ch- Japanese were so serious about it. And, uh, and nobody really knew anything. They were all still trying to learn nutrition because one of the greatest advents for the sport of triathlon was like power bars, you know, because other than that, you used to just toast up peanut butter sandwiches. And so there's so many things that have come through triathlon that have helped cycling and mountain biking and everything. Uh, so it's trickled down. So, you know, we'd go over there and I, I'll venture off just for a second and tell you the story. I used to sit on a milk carton in the back of this bike shop called B&L Sports over in uh, Kona. And Nick Rott and his wife owned it. And this big old metal building, it wasn't air conditioned. It was about 150 degrees in there. And I'd sit on the back of this thing in a milk carton and people would line up They'd come through with their bikes, and I'd look at them, and I'd say, okay, go to this next stand. And we would have boxes of reverse seat posts, and this is when Scott Aero Bars first came out. We'd have boxes of those things. Dan Enfield was there with his QR bikes. And and these people from Europe didn't know me from nobody, but they would uh, – they word filtered out pretty quick because everybody would go to Kona for two weeks ahead of time. They said, if you don't go to that box shop and get that guy to look at you, you got no chance. And, and it was immediate feedback. People would get on their bikes, go ride down Queen K, come back, and, and either be sad or happy. Well, fortunately, they were all, almost always happy uh, because we were making them one or two, three miles an hour faster because we were giving them, you know, new technology. And then, you know, Steve had wheels and uh, we just had a lot going on. And that's when the sport learned so much stuff. I was doing a lot of wind tunnel stuff back then and uh, doing frame shapes and working on helmets and, you know, clothing and everything. So um, it's kind of interesting. Now I'll be at a race. Some guy come up to me and he says, I've been racing for a little while. Have you ever thought about doing this? I said, yeah, I did that in 84, 85, whatever. You know, I, I hate saying those things, but uh, we did so much wind tunnel work earlier on that, you know, set the stage for what's going on now. But uh, regardless of that, the, um, it still ended up being a common thread that you'd go out on the race course, a race morning, and here's these guys from Europe that look like Charles Atlas and these women that were so tough, you know. And you go out to about mile 35 and they're all sitting up on their bikes and their brake hoods pedaling, about half of them crying. Oh, my neck hurts so bad or, you know, this hurts so bad. And I go, well, okay. And so we'd keep looking at it. And finally I decided, well, I need to start making some bike seats because they're all having these common problems you get off their bikes and they can't run. And I don't care how fast you're on that bike. For a local sprint race and all, you can't go fast enough to get away from a run that's three minutes a mile slower. Uh, it's just you got to be able to get off that bike and run. You don't have to go to the Olympics, but you got to get off that bike and be able to run pretty good because uh, that's a, a big deal. Bob um, Babbitt had said that in the first time he, he raced Kona back in the day, I, I don't know if it was 81, 82, um, but the nutrition that he used was, I think it was McDonald's. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, there used to be a guy I'd work with over there, and he had a little fanny pack full of sugar cubes, and he had a sugar cube for like every half mile, and he had them all done, and um, that's – what people had. I mean, you tell people, I'm going to eat sugar cube every half mile. And you go, well, man, I wouldn't do that ever. Well, that that's what nutrition was then. You know, everybody's toasting up little squares of peanut butter stuff. And so it's, it's really improved. Well, I wanted to um, certainly ask you uh, two, two final questions. 
Um, the first question is related to um, what does um, 2021 and beyond look like in terms of JCOB and innovation, new product lines, existing product lines, um, how you plan to get in front of um, customers, engage customers, um, any insight that you can share on that for 2021 and beyond? Well, on products, uh, we're going to tune on our product offerings a little bit. The uh, saddles are pretty set right now. I just did a cover change on them to change the graphics. And so graphics are, you're not going to make everybody happy on graphics. So I, I like them. That's all mostly. But um, the uh, biggest thing we're going to work on is helping people get positioned better on their bikes. And so now with the Zoom, Zoom and, uh, you know, this format, uh, you know, people can log on and then we can, you know, sit there and talk them through changes on their bike. Because I, I get people sending videos, you know, one or two a day. What do, how do I look? I say, well, you look like a goat sitting on your bike. You know, this is all bad. And so, you know, somebody says, oh, I've been fit. I said, yeah, well, you go get your money back because it didn't work out. And it doesn't mean the fitter is a bad guy. It just means he might not have got the right feedback from the customer because customers are the worst. They're they're worried about making you happy. And I go, no, you you pay a lot of money. You want me to make you happy. And uh, you have to have the feedback, good, honest feedback to get that. But it also, you have to have somebody, what I find is um, if somebody's having comfort problems, they need to be on a trainer and they need to be pedaling at their standard power levels. They don't have to be at maximum race effort, but, uh, you know, some guy that races at 300 watts can't sit on a trainer at 90 watts and give you real feedback. He's got to be more in a race position. And that's like a, if you're going to go buy some running shoes, you got to get on a treadmill and run at your race pace to see how your heel strike and all those. Um I did a good bit of work on uh, video and run analysis, uh, run gates, and then applying that to your cycling position. Because when you run, your body chooses your leg length extension. And uh, it's pretty interesting. You can probably go to 25 bike fitters that are the best in your area or whoever, and your seat height will get changed 25 times because there's not really a, a exact math on that. But what I found, or I thought was interesting, was if you, uh, you know, get on a treadmill and run or go outside and run and you videotape somebody running down the street, then that foot drop and that leg extension is a pretty good gauge to set them up with. But the flip side is you can change someone's seat height a couple of centimeters up and down and their power doesn't really change. The adaption time might take, you know, a couple of bike rides, but seat height's really not that big of a deal. So uh, people worry about that a lot, but uh, seat height does affect comfort a lot. It doesn't really affect power, but it really affects comfort. And so we're trying to really uh, buy into the new technology at Jacob and, and uh, do video analysis to help people out. And it's going to be live. So when you call in to get your video analysis done, you want to have your tools there and everything because I'm going to be telling you things to go change. And uh, then you get on your bike, pedal it for a couple of minutes, and you go, well, you're an idiot, or yeah, it's better, or whatever. But that's the only way you're going to really help because so many people, you know, with COVID and all that, it's so different. You just can't load your bike up and just show up down at some guy's house and get your fitting done. So I, I think this will be a big help. Uh, and it, it just helps uh, – should give us a place in the industry to use some of our technology. And it's the same with cranks. Uh, I have a lot of people who put on shorter cranks, and that means going from, say, a, a 170 to a, a 155. They go, well, how much should I change my seat height? I go, well, you know, change it a half inch. But I don't know. I can't tell because you and I are just having an email conversation. But uh, with this video technology, we should be able to really dial them in because a lot of times – a shorter crank means you need to move your seat forward or back to build more power into the power strip. Those are all good, good inputs. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, we have athletes who are buying a thousand dollar bike 
And yeah. so the concept of doing a three hundred and three hundred fifty dollar city, you know, fitting is um, is really not in the in the cards. They're just not going to do it. That's not that's not something they're interested in. But what I what I will say, and and, and I'd love to get somebody of, of your experience and background to to check me on this, is that there are three touch points that your body has with the bike. Yeah, you know, your 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 behind the legs and your hand. And I find that most of the time folks are playing with the seat length and, and location, the stem length and location of the seat. And many of the times the issues are actually how far they're stretched over the top tube and the width of the bars and the positioning of bars. What, what, is, your, what is your feeling on is fitting – yeah, as you said, you can have 25 different fitters and 25 different results. Is fitting something that is could be made a little simpler or who knows? Small things like handlebar widths and all, you can't get involved in that too much uh, on a, a bike fit unless you're really going to spend a couple hours doing that uh, because that, that shows up um, – you got to be, be doing oxygen uptake tests and all that. Now, it can immediately feel better to the customer because they're, they're opened up better, but that doesn't really mean it's faster. And then you're going to pay an aerodynamic price. And so it depends on what kind of racing they're doing. Whereas if it's just aero bars you're doing fittings on, then you say, well, let's get your elbow pads right because you want to be able to leverage your aero bars to build power for going up hills. Um, I'm personally not a big fan of this new thing where everybody's in this praying mantis thing. Uh, I think that it's in a wind tunnel, it's pretty fast. And at Ironman Florida, it's probably pretty fast. It, you know, but you go to Lake Placer, somewhere it's hilly, uh, you need the leverage of your bars. And so I'm more of a little bit more flatter traditional guy on that. But, you know, it, if some guy comes to me and he's going to, go for a UCI world track record, well then yeah, we're we're going all up here. But um, you know, there, there's a lot to that. But crank length is um there's a lot of tools. Like we make these little short top caps and we make stems and stuff. We all use to to change your front end of your bike because ultimately we're all working around product managers and there are designs. And so we've got to make your bike be able to fit what's proven to be more performance oriented. Whereas some guy riding down the beach in Galveston or out in San, Santa Clara, he doesn't care about all that. You know, he doesn't even need all that stuff. But but the performance people do, the people in, in the triathlon and the hardcore racing world, and now with gravel bikes coming along, it's just like mountain bikes started out. It was a fun deal. It was social, blah, blah. Well, now gravel bikes go, well, we're going to do this 100-mile ride. Maybe I could go – how do I go 30 minutes faster on this gravel bike? It's, well, you've got to – stretch out more to use your back as a suspension part and uh, help take pressure off your hands. So your seat has to hold your core up, give you core support and your bars have to be low. And, you know, it's aerodynamics. When you start, you start going 18 or 20 miles an hour on a gravel bike, it, it's just road bike aerodynamics. And so you got to do the whole deal. So it's kind of interesting how all the sports meld together. John, we uh, we really appreciate having you today on California Triathlon Soup. And it sounds like with the existing product lines, the new product lines, the push to get in front of, to make the direct connection with customers and support them, you guys are going to have a great 2021 and beyond. So I just want to say thank you. And I wish you a good 2021 and beyond. Well, thank you for letting me on today. I, I unfortunately tend to ramble, so I hope that wasn't too bad. But uh, glad to help you and be glad to come back anytime. It was fantastic. Thank you so much, John.